Indugu, I've been excited to have this time with you because I have seen you perform many times. I've been involved with teaching with you many times. I've been to your clinics. I've been to so many things. And each time, you've inspired me to an incredibly high level. Well, it works both ways, Dom. Yeah. Because, I, you know, I've always admired what you do, how you do it, and how you've built around what we do. Ah, so it's it's just like a mutual love and respect. Thank you so much. So you know, I'm glad I, to be here. I have admired so many times in hearing you play, and I've admired equally you speaking in front of students because you have a way of performing that really captures the moment of what is needed as a musician. And then when you speak, you find the right thing to say at that moment. It's a pretty it's a pretty unique skill. Musically, who you have played with and recorded with is a who's who. It's really amazing. Where did this begin for you? How did music step into your life? Where did this whole thing start? I'm originally from Shreveport, Louisiana. Yeah. <laughs> which has nothing to do with anything, <laughs> except there, at six years old, I was beating on oatmeal boxes and coffee cans in the backyard with tree branches. Mm. My family moved out to Los Angeles when I was eight. I went to school and I said, I want to play the drums. And the school teacher said, you have the lips and the arms to play the trombone, so you can't play the drums. So I didn't play. Oh my God. I sat out for seven years. When I got to junior high school or middle school, as they call it now, I walked in the band room one day and I told the teacher, I says, I want to play the drums. He says, well, here are two sticks, here's a practice pad, here's a book, read it, come back, show me what you got. And that's how it started. How interesting. And then this same teacher, took me to my first jazz festival. Because at, at my school, Charles Lloyd had been a teacher there. He had just left the school to start the band with Keith and Jack and Cecil McBee. And my teacher had connections to get us tickets to the jazz festival. So he took us to the jazz festival and I saw Jack play with Charles Lloyd. I saw Buddy Rich Big Band. <laughs> I saw the Crusaders with Sticks Hooper. Wow. I saw Vi Red's band, and I saw uh, the Don Ellis Orchestra with two drummers and a percussionist. Oh my gosh, who were the two drummers in, remember? Steve Bohannon, yeah. Alan Estes, <laughs> and uh, Lee Pastoris. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. So I was turned out. I said, you know, it's confirmed. Yeah. This is really what I want to do, and I'm changing my major and everything, because I was a math guy before that. Really? I thought I wanted to be a math guy because computers were just coming in. So I said, well, I could at least be a computer programmer or yeah, something, yeah. you know, because they started the new math and all that. So I was into that. But once I saw that this was a viable inroad for me and that was really what my passion was, I went for it. At that point, did you, did you, were there people that you took lessons with? Were, were there... Now that's the tricky story. Yeah. Now, I'm from a very impoverished background, my father. And when I say that, my father left when I was 13. Soon as I committed to playing the drums, he left. Interesting. You know, it was my mother taking care of us and I was the youngest of seven kids. Of course, there's a big gap, so everyone wasn't there at the same time. There were only three of us there during the time when my father left. I had to get odd jobs to, to pay for a drum set eventually, but there was a teacher in town by the name of Clarence Johnston. Clarence taught another drummer at the school by the name of Raymond Pounds. Mm. Raymond shared his lessons with me every Monday because <laughs> I couldn't afford the lessons. Now I thought Raymond was paying for the lessons. I come to find out later, Raymond couldn't afford his lessons either and Clarence was teaching him for free and Clarence had made a deal with him. Okay, I'm sharing this with you. You share it with someone else. How powerful. And, um, powerful. That's the way it started, and then I was mentored by Styx Hooper. Ah, oh, Styx. <laughs> Great player. I humbled myself to, to learn from those masters and just soak it all in. So they become kind of mentors to you? In, in yes, certain... yeah. Those, those two guys and, of course, Shelly Mann. Yeah. And uh, I hung out with Earl Palmer a lot, mm. and those were, those were my, my goalposts. How amazing. When, Shelly Mann, what, what a great, you know, I had some lessons with Shelly also many, many years ago. What, what, what was that like with the lessons with Shelly Mann? Shelly Mann was, I mean, he had this, this dual identity. Mm. You know, he was a session guy during the day, yeah. and he was a club guy by night. Yeah, the manhole. Yeah, yeah. So I never went to the sessions with him, 
I always went to the manhole. Yeah. And I was listening to this guy swing, and then I, he would introduce me to all of these jazz greats and all of that. And he would sit down and he would talk to me about just different things. He was just a sweetheart. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that was my upbringing. Boy, that's absolutely powerful. Was there, was there music you were listening to at this time? Were there you know, albums or artists that you were hearing at that time to further influence oh, yeah. you? yeah. I mean, you know, of course, the first song I learned to play was a song from my father, mm -hmm. Horace Silver, and then Jive Samba, yeah. um, Cannonball Adderley, and then Mongo Santa Maria had like Watermelon Man and Together and those songs, and we, we learned those. And then we just started to learn everything from the radio. You know, uh, some of my uh, schoolmates from elementary school say, you know, I remember you before you really were playing the drums, you were Ringo Starr in the school talent show. <laughs> you know, so I was miming Ringo Starr, yeah. you know, and stuff like that. So I just, I listened to everything, because radio during that time was just but radio. Yeah, yeah, they just yeah. played everything. They yeah. played Sammy Davis Jr., they played James Brown, they played Jimi Hendrix, they played Frank Sinatra. They'd play Motown. they just played everything, Chuck Berry, all of it, all together. So I wow. just assumed that was the way of life. Boy, it sounds like that. That's because your influence and, and what you're able to play, the genres, is so wide of what you can do. Well, it was because of that. That's I didn't know beautiful. that you had to commit to something. Interesting. You know, I was interested in jazz, but really, did I know what jazz really was? Because the jazz guys were doing the sessions for the the R&B stuff yeah, and the yeah, pop yeah. stuff yeah, yeah. and all of that. So I didn't really know what, what the, the real narrow jef definition of jazz really was, especially being in L.A., yeah. you know, because there wasn't like a bebop alley where, yeah. you know, like wasn't 52nd Street. Like in New York, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. where everybody's swinging. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, everybody was doing all of these different things. You know, so I, I felt like that's what I needed to do. First of all, what's so profound is that the first song you learned was song from my father. Yeah. And with your father having left it as a young boy, that's incredible how the, that, that's a, there's a movie in there someplace. Yeah, 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 yeah. There, yeah, there yeah. Really is an and you know what, I never thought about that, but that was like the happening song. And Horace Silver's album cover actually had a picture of his father on the cover. Interesting. John Tavares Silver. Interesting. There's something very deep in that. That's yes, very, very powerful. Yes, yes. You went on to play, so now you, you're, you're starting to become a professional and people are starting to hire you. How did you kind of go from, from just playing the drums to now making this a, a career? How did that come about? While in high school, I made my first recording with a local guy, a guy by the name of Harold Johnson, Harold Johnson Sextet. He was popular, and he was a few years older than me. Hmm. So he was like the popular local piano player, church guy and, and local guy, kind of like a Les McCannish kind of guy. Nice. And uh, I made my first record with him, and that forced me to have to join the Musicians' Union at 16. Though, in those days, you had to audition for the Musicians' Union. I remember Union. those days, absolutely. So I auditioned for the Musicians' Union. I said, wow, I got a Musicians' Union card now? <laughs> Maybe I can do this. And they didn't bring everybody in. You had to play. You had to you, play. You had to play, yeah. You had to read something. You had to play something. Right. I was like, whoa, this, this is serious business here. Yeah, yeah. So then um, Herbie Hancock came to my school, and I played with him at, a, at an assembly at, at the school. And right after I graduated, he called me and Gerald Wilson called me. They both had come to my school. Amazing. And, you know, Gerald conducted the big band at the school yeah. and I played, and I played with Herbie. And from there, you know, people saw me with Gerald, we did the manhole, and everybody came out, Earl Palmer, <laughs> Paul Humphreys, all the drummers and everybody came out wanting to hear this 17-year-old drummer. <laughs> you know, in Herbie, we played the Forum. My first gig was playing the Forum, wow. opening for the Iron Butterfly. <laughs> oh, my God. So from there, it just, like, took off. And in between, I had played with Willie Bobo, local yeah. gigs and yeah. stuff like that. And Willie that, Bobo, great percussionist. Yeah. And just, yeah, yeah. Who had yeah. played on a Herbie Hancock record playing drums and timbales. Oh, interesting. You know, interesting. so... All that was part of what I was doing because L.A. had a strong Latin scene during that time. Interesting. You know, so I'm around all of these guys that are playing professionally. There was another guy I started dating his daughter. Uh, his name was Eddie Davis, not to be confused with Lockjaw Davis. Right, right, right. But he had a regular gig six nights a week down in Newport Beach. 
So I'd go over to pick up his daughter and I'd watch him go to work. <laughs> and I said, wow, these guys are making a living doing this with some regularity. I should focus on that. So that's what I did. So interesting. So you, so you, you started to see the, the fact that it could happen. There could be a way to survive in the music industry. And that drove you there. Obviously, you were driven by the passion of, of music guiding you along the way. You had this hunger. Yes. What were you listening to? Was, it, was there a wide variety of recordings? Were you buying Listen albums? Were you trying all, to... Buying albums up the yin yang. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All the Blue Note stuff. Right. You know, I know the, the, the funny story is for me to learn how to swing before I got a drum set, they let me take the school drum set home for Christmas vacation. I had two weeks. Hmm. I bought Dexter Gordon's One Flight Up album with Art <laughs> Taylor playing. Oh, great. And myself and this bass player that was in the little trio in school, we played to that song all day, every day. Wow. And we learned to swing from that album. How amazing. Dexter Gordon taught you how to swing. That's basically what that comes down to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's actually a great, that's actually a great way to teach to get kids to do that, to play to music, so they can, to almost to a degree, absorb. Yeah. Which is yeah. what you did. You got that from. That's well, huge. Well, because you're increasing your ear training. Yeah. Your sensitivity, and see, back in those days, it wasn't headphones. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you really had to put your ear to the speakers. Yeah. You know, you had a little stereo record player. Yeah. And you had to listen. So it wasn't about going in there tearing the walls down. You really had to pay attention and listen. Boy, that's pretty, pretty amazing. So you got involved with, with education. I mean, you know, your clinics and your teaching, that's a whole other side of you that's profound, aside from you performing and doing sessions and producing and what you do. In the education side, how'd that come about? How'd you get involved with, with teaching? And going to college, I went to Cal State Dominguez Hills. Brand new, I went to a brand new high school. Right. So we, we established all the traditions for the high school. I wrote the drum cadences for the marching band and all of that. You know, you, you decide on the school colors, the mascot, nice. uh, what the school song is and all of that. <laughs> so Cal State Dominguez was a brand new college. And the thing about college was you could do performance, which was classical, it wasn't jazz, mm -hmm. or you did music ed. So I did music ed. Because back in those days, there weren't many of us in classical music. Yeah. There was Hubert Laws and Willie Ruff to some degree. And that was about it. Wow. So we didn't see our future doing classical music. So they always told us, if you get a music ed degree, this is what you can fall back on. You can always teach or do whatever else around that. So that's what I did. Yeah. I didn't think I would be a teacher because I thought I would be on the road all my life right. and all that. But then I grew up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when the studio thing started to change and uh, started to fizzle out for a lot of us here in, in L.A., yeah. that became my avenue after going out doing clinics and so forth. Yeah, yeah. That became my avenue.